All right, good morning. I would like to call this meeting of the Public Accounts Committee to order and welcome everyone in attendance. My name is Shannon Phillips. I'm the MLA for Lethbridge West. I'm the chair of this committee. So as we begin, I'll invite those participating in the committee room to introduce themselves, starting on my right. Good morning, Roger Reed, MLA for Livingston McLeod. Garth Rosal, Vermillion Lloyd Minster Wainwright. Good morning, Cyril Turn, MLA for Spruce Grove, Stony Plain. Good morning, everyone. Peter Singh, MLA, Calgary East. Good morning, Jordan Walker, Sherwood Park. Good morning, Jackie Lovely, Camrose Constituency. Good morning, Dale Beasley, ADM Properties, Alberta Infrastructure. Good morning, Ian Robertson, Alberta Infrastructure. Mary Pearson, Deputy Minister, Alberta Infrastructure. Good morning, Dale Fung, Alberta Infrastructure. Michelle Fleming, Office of the Auditor General. Good morning, Brad Ireland, Assistant Auditor General. Marie Renault, St. Albert. Good morning, Rocky Pancholi, Edmonton White Mud. Arnold Schmidt, Edmonton Gold Bar. Good morning, Nancy Robert, Clerk of Journals and Committees. Good morning, Aaron Roth, Committee Clerk. And uh, we have folks joining us through various methods of communication. I do note uh, uh, we have at least one member joining us uh, via video conference, uh, Ms. Armstrong Harmaniak, if you could introduce yourself for the record. And uh, after that, anyone else? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jackie Armstrong Hominick, MLA for Saskatchewan Gagerville. And, and okay, that's everyone. Very good. Uh, so, a few housekeeping uh, items uh, for the officials in the room. Uh, uh, the microphones are operated by Hansard, and uh, committee proceedings are live streamed on the internet and broadcast on Alberta Assembly TV. Those participating by video conference are encouraged to turn off your camera, uh, turn on your camera while speaking, mute your uh, microphone uh, when not speaking, and turn off your camera as well. Uh, members participating virtually who want to be on the speakers list can uh, put a message in the chat uh, or uh, message the committee clerk, uh, Aaron Roth. And so we'll now move on to approval of the agenda. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda this morning? Uh, seeing none, uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, friends that someone move that the agenda for March 29th, 2022, meeting of our Standing Committee on Public Accounts, be dis approved as distributed. Moved by Member Reed. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on this motion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. That motion is carried. And I notice that uh, Mr. Singh has now joined us. If you wouldn't, uh, did you? Okay, you had been, you had left and come back. Okay, good. All right. Oh, but Mr. Tour is uh, is now arriving. Okay, uh, Mr. Tour, I'll let you get settled in if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself for the record. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alid Vendor Tour, Calgary Falcon Ridge. Okay, very good. Uh, moving on to the approval of the minutes. We have minutes, friends, from our last meeting on March 22nd. Uh, do members have any errors or omissions to note? Seeing uh, none, I'll ask that someone move that the minutes of the March 22nd, 2022 meeting of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts be approved as distributed. Moved by Member Pancholi. Is there any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion is carried. Uh, so we will now welcome our guests from the Ministry of Infrastructure who are here to address the annual report uh, from 2021 and outstanding recommendations uh, from the Auditor General. Uh, I, as we are in a no uh, morning session meeting uh, time rotation, uh, th we're in an ordinary two hour meeting. So our ministry opening remarks are 10 minutes and the first rotation is 15 and then 10 thereafter. Uh, and so I'll invite ministry officials to provide opening remarks not exceeding 10 minutes. Your time starts when you need to start speaking. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. At the outset, I want to thank the Office of the Auditor General for its desire to improve the delivery of infrastructure for Albertans. We take the Auditor's recommendations seriously and work hard to implement them. With me at the table are Dale Beasley, the Assistant Deputy Minister of Properties Division, Dale Fung, the Senior Financial Officer, and Ian Robertson, Chief of Staff. There are also officials from the Department in attendance in the gallery. 2020-2021 was a difficult year in Alberta. The COVID pandemic, a recession, and the collapse of world oil prices significantly affected Alberta's economy and the livelihoods of many Albertans. Infrastructure staff and contractors worked diligently to keep approximately 1,600 government buildings safe through the pandemic with enhanced cleaning practices and the installation of safety measures. Additionally, we allocated $238.7 million of Alberta's Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, the ICIP program funding, to the COVID-19 Resilience Stream. This Resilience Stream money is being used for a broad range of improvements on provincially owned facilities. 
The focus was on projects that could start immediately and be completed quickly to support employment and economic activity to help offset the challenges brought on by the pandemic. We know that investing in infrastructure during difficult times is a key means for governments to invest in the economy and to keep people working. Therefore, in 2021, infrastructure staff remained focused on leading the delivery of the province's capital investments. As a result, the work undertaken at the department supported thousands of jobs in planning, design and construction and ensured economic boosts were directed in local communities. Ultimately, staff worked to ensure Albertans would benefit over the long term through increased access to the vital programs and services housed within the facilities we built, renewed and maintained. I am proud of all that the staff achieved and I would like to take a few minutes now to provide you with the highlights of our accomplishments for the year under review. Through 2021, infrastructure worked diligently to develop the frame for the Infrastructure Accountability Act and the 20-year strategic capital plan. And in summer 2020, we invited Albertans to provide input. More than 3,100 responses were received representing Albertans from around the province and from numerous sectors. We listened to what they had to say and ensured the act and the plan reflected their input. In 2021, infrastructure worked closely with other ministries and stakeholders to deliver public infrastructure. We completed construction of 20 new or modernized schools, benefiting students and communities throughout the province. And we continued with the construction and planning, design and tender of 68 additional school projects. One of these projects, the Elizabeth Quintal School at Peerless Trout First Nation, was awarded the Learning Environment Solutions Jurors Award from the Association for Learning Environments. This North American organization is dedicated to building fantastic learning environments for children. It is wonderful to see the team's hard work recognized. We also improved our school capital project delivery processes by following through on recommendations from the Auditor General's 2016 audit on systems to manage the school building program. In December 2020, the Office of the Auditor General concluded that these recommendations had been fully implemented. Infrastructure also worked to address recommendations related to the Willow Square Continuing Care Project in Fort McMurray. In July 2020, we developed an implementation plan to address the recommendations. We then worked to enhance standards and best practices on project management plans, financial management tools, and oversight measures to ensure consistency in project delivery practices and risk management. And in February of 2022, infrastructure advised the Office of the Auditor General that these recommendations are implemented and ready for follow-up audit. Turning your attention to health projects, in 2021, infrastructure completed the construction of five health facilities, including the Medicine Hat Regional Hospital, the Willow Square Fort McMurray Residential Facility-Based Care Centre, repairs to the Northern Lights Regional Health Centre, also located in Fort McMurray, the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, and Phase 1 of the Grand Prairie Regional Hospital. I'm also pleased to note that Phase 2 was completed in 2021, and the new hospital recently celebrated its official opening. Throughout the year, we continued planning, design, and construction work on 29 health facility projects, including planning for the new Edmonton Hospital and the redevelopment of the Red Deer Regional Hospital. Infrastructure also remained busy with planning, design and construction of government-owned facilities. In 2021, this included the completion of the new Kananaskis Emergency Services Centre, completion of upgrades to courthouses in Hinton and Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation, with upgrade work continuing in Cochrane, Brooks and Edmonton. And lastly, we began construction on the AgriValue Processing Business Incubator in Leduc and on the Red Deer Justice Centre. In 2021, we continued to focus on expanding partnership opportunities to enhance private sector involvement in the financing of infrastructure. This included the development and release of an updated public-private partnership framework and the new unsolicited proposal framework. These frameworks demonstrate government's commitment to attracting private sector investment to the province to help build much needed public infrastructure, create jobs and stimulate the economy while making the most of limited taxpayer dollars. And in 2021, we moved through a competitive procurement process to deliver a bundle of five high schools using a P3 delivery methodology. In the fall of 2021, we awarded the P3 contract to Concert Bird Partners at an estimated savings of $114 million for Alberta taxpayers. 
This P3 project is supporting over 1,650 jobs and will provide about 7,000 new student spaces when the schools are open. We continued our work with the Government of Canada to approve projects through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure, or ICIP program, which provides Alberta, Albertans with an allocation of $3.66 billion in federal capital funding. To date, 197 infrastructure projects and project bundles have been approved in 30 constituencies across Alberta. This includes 112 shovel-ready capital maintenance and renewal projects or project bundles. In addition to capital project delivery, infrastructure is also responsible for maintaining and preserving government-owned and leased properties with a focus on sound fiscal stewardship. In 2021, infrastructure continued to work to save dollars and improve its environmental footprint by making the best use of existing facilities. By reducing lease space in that year, we realized savings of about 3.4 million in annual lease cost. We also initiated work that saved millions by relocating staff to redevelop spaces in two government-owned facilities. This include moder included modernizing office space in Commerce Place and moving the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, the Provincial Operating Centre, to renewed space in the Muriel Stanley Venn Provincial Centre. It is impossible for infrastructure to deliver the number of projects we do without having solid practices in place. So in 2021, this included our work with vendors to enhance accountability and ensure best value through the introduction of our Vendor Performance Management Program. The Vendor Performance Management Program was launched in January of 2020, and by the end of 2021, the program had included 146 vendors working on 335 contracts, totaling more than a billion dollars to ensure that savings or value is achieved. We also continued to focus on achieving red tape reduction goals to support stakeholders by reducing regulatory and administrative burden. In fact, in 2021, we exceeded the red tape reduction targets for the second year in a row, and we remain on track to contribute to the government's overall target of a 33% reduction. To date, this included 992 administrative process improvements, and we anticipate another 1,100 to be completed by 2023. Also, in 2021, infrastructure supported initiatives to address the pandemic by securing sites for personal protective equipment storage, vaccination storage, as well as vaccination sites. So while 2020-2021 brought with it many challenges worldwide, infrastructure faced them head on. The staff adapted, strategized and acted. So together with our stakeholders and contractors, our efforts ensured Albertans were working, local businesses and economies were benefiting, and the Alberta families and communities would get the good public infrastructure they needed. So this concludes my summary of the year's highlights for infrastructure. So on behalf of the department, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee. All right, very good. I'll now turn things over to the Officer of the Auditor General for uh, five minutes, Mr. Ireland. Thank you, and good morning, Chair, committee members, and ministry management. Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes to highlight our outstanding recommendations related to the ministry, and then I'll briefly summarize the auditing of the financial transactions that we perform at the ministry. Um, so we have two outstanding recommendations at the ministry related to project management from our June 2020 report, where we recommended improvements be made to certain project management processes for capital projects and that the ministry improve its performance measures for capital projects. The ministry has indicated to us that both recommendations are ready for assessment and we plan to complete our assessment this summer. Also consistent with other ministries, we audit financial transactions at the department as part of our audit of the consolidated financial statements of the province. And that concludes uh, our opening remarks and I'll pass it back to you, Chair. Uh, very good, thank you very much uh, to the Office of the Auditor General. So now we've got our first rotation. We'll start with the official opposition with a 15 minute block, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to all the officials for being here today uh, to present the 2020-21 uh, annual report uh, and report to this committee. Um, I'd like to begin, if I can, um, with uh, page four of the annual report um, in the opening comments from the minister. 
Um, in the second paragraph there, the minister states, uh, the minister's message states, last year infrastructure was given the responsibility to be a leading ministry in assisting Alberta's economic recovery with the largest infrastructure investment in the province's history. Um, would the deputy confirm that that is an accurate statement uh, in your opinion, that uh, this was the largest infrastructure investment in the province's history? So thank you for the question. I know that for 2021, um, we provided 6.9 billion in GOA capital plan spending and infrastructure's portion was 1.3 billion, which was about 19% of that. So the overall capital plan is delivered by many partners. And what we've got for that is, is the 2021 capital plan was generally comparable with the 2020, uh, with the year before uh, and the budget. So, we do have that, that we did spend significant amounts. So we did spend um, s almost 660 million on health facilities in the budget. There was 450 million for school facilities, including the school CMR, which was 175 million. We did spend 33 million on government s facilities and 91 million on government owned facilities preservation. And so that was fairly significant, and that overlaid, uh, that, that included a lot of investment from the, uh, the federal government as well. Thank you, Deputy. I, I just want to um, point you to the um, Government of Alberta's annual report for 2020. I, I'm not sure if you have it handy, but it, this is the overall Government of Alberta annual report for 2020 21. And in that uh, document on page, I believe it's page 12. It indicates there the capital plan investment going back to 2008, 2009. And if you look and it records the capital investment, the infrastructure investment by the government of Alberta over those years, um, you know, thir 12, 13 years going back. And it indicates, as you pointed out, Deputy, that uh, for 2020, 21, the capital plan uh, investment was $6.896 uh, billion. And however, if you look Back on that, in 2017-2018, the capital plan investment was nine, nine point, or $9 billion. So I'm just questioning, you know, we hear, I assume an annual report is a factual document. I think Albertans assume that, right, that they can look at that and, and get a clear picture of, of the state of um, the government's work in a fiscal year and how it's met its targets. And we begin in, in the infrastructure annual report with a statement by the minister that this was the largest infrastructure spending in the province's history and yet right here within the government of Alberta's own annual report it indicates for example in 2017-2018 the capital spend was 30 percent higher than what was in 2020-21. So can you clarify why the minister would state it's the biggest in infrastructure investment in history in, pro in the province's history when clearly it is not? So thank you for the question. It's a good question. I believe the context of the overall document is over the, the length of the three-year plan, and therefore I can get you some information on that. So I was answering with a one-year response. You had indicated a one-year as well, but it's the rolling three-year that that would pertain to, but I can, I can verify and get you get some information as well. I'm going to, I would appreciate some follow-up yep. information. I can. Um, but, you know, as, as it's reported in the Government of Alberta annual report, it is reported per year, right? It's not a three year. It's, it's reported each annual year. And, and as the number lines up there for 2020-21 as $6.896 billion uh, for 2020, um, that's the same as is reported in, in the infrastructure annual report. And that number, which the Minister of Infrastructure claims is the largest provincial investment in infrastructure in the province's history, is not, it's 30% lower than the $9 billion in 2017-2018. So I don't see the three-year rollout there. It's, it's reported by year. So even from a year-to-year -year co comparison, it's clearly there's a discrepancy. Um, so if the uh, deputy is able to uh, clarify the minister's statement that the investment spending in 2020 was the largest in the province's history, I'd appreciate that. 
Um, we can definitely get you something back in writing, but I know that it is the con context over over the program. So I will take I will take that back and get you some some clarity. Well, I would appreciate that. I think that's pretty important for, for transparency, right? When statements are being made by the deputy by the minister, actually. Um, and I guess it calls into question, are there any other statements that are made throughout the annual report that you feel need greater context so that Albertans can get a better picture of the accuracy of those statements? I think it's fair to say that the department tries to ensure the accuracy of the annual report. It's one of our obligations. Uh, for So there's a great amount of detail in here that we are happy to answer any questions you may have uh, with respect to that. So did the department review the accuracy of the minister's statement? Um, I would have to get back to you on that. Um, just I wasn't here at that point, so I don't want to misspeak. But generally, we do look at the overall annual report. OK, perhaps maybe. Um, I'm not sure if the Auditor General might be able to weigh in on this, only because uh, they look at their annual the reporting. And um, you know, in the, in the Auditor General, if, if they're able to comment, would you uh, agree that that statement is accurate from the minister, that it's the largest provincial spending in uh, in infrastructure? Um, thanks for the question. Uh, we wouldn't have looked specifically at, at that statement and done any any audit work to verify that. So again, we'd have to take that away and, and look at that. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Perhaps I'll move on to um, another set of questions then. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the South Edmonton Hospital project that the uh, that the deputy referred to and has mentioned a few times uh, in the annual report. Um, as a MLA for Edmonton White Mud, uh, a, a, a hospital on the south side is something that's of high interest to my constituents and to the surrounding communities. Um, we have a, a large growing population um, and the nearest hospital is quite a bit away and I think this has clearly been a priority uh, when the NDP was in government and, and certainly under the current government we've seen a delay a little bit but I still see reference to this uh, priority in the in the infrastructure annual report, um, and I know my uh, my constituents would, are very interested in seeing that hospital being built as quickly as possible. So it's mentioned on page 11 of the annual report that the South Edmonton Hospital is a is a candidate to be a a P3 model development. That's how it, it's it's proposed, I guess. And so my question is, when will the decision be made by the ministry as to when whether a P3 model will be used um, or if it will go for a different model. When will that decision be made? So as you've noted, um, this site is, is underway. The South Edmonton Hospital will increase access and capacity for needed health care services and the programs in Edmonton and surrounding communities. So it is underway. The location, as you mentioned, is in the southwest. And planning work continues. So this work was impacted um, a little bit due to the clinical staff availability during COVID. Uh, which resulted in some delays of the functional programming that we had. Uh, but we, are, we still worked actively through the year in question on a lot of work with the city to make sure it was zoned properly for a hospital and making sure that we had the site works and working with EPCOR and others. So while we were doing that, we've got to make sure we know what we're building. So the functional programming is actually pretty key to making sure that we can go to market sounding for the P3 expert because that the p3 assessment because it is a large project and it will be undertaken um, a market sounding very shortly uh, with respect to determining whether it could be a p3 opportunity or not and so that is underway this year do you have a do you have an estimation of when that will be completed that assessment um, I'd like to say again uh, as with what we're doing is we are dealing with um, clinicians and everything to make sure that we can build what we need to so the planning is ongoing to make sure that we we are secure on what we're building and uh, this work has been impacted by clinical staff availability during COVID but we are undertaking the market sounding this year. Okay thank you very much. Um, so you know we've seen various p3 models in this province used in you know school projects which with mixed results might I add and I would actually perhaps mixed results as a generous interpretation um, it's it's often been met with great cr criticism and critique using the p3 model um, having known many uh, families and uh, school staff who now work in p3 schools or significant challenges associated with those schools uh, which are well documented um, so what is the uh, you know, it, usually a P3 model is 
25, 30, 40 years, what is the maximum um, time or length of time the government might consider a P3 contract for something like the South Edmonton Hospital, with including the construction and ongoing maintenance? So that's a, a difficult question to answer to a certain degree. The P3s have been used since 20, you know, since 2010 for schools. We've got the P3 models that have delivered and maintained 45 new schools and a, a further 10 are underway. We actually do use lessons learned and we have a process in place from previous, previous P3s to help improve the process and ensure we have new spaces that meet the needs of the school jurisdictions, the parents and, and others. Um, so we continue to engage with, admin, with education and school uh, districts. With respect to the P3 for the, the hospital, again, with the functional planning and the dictating for that, it, the market sounding will actually help also decide how long we would actually put a, a, a project out uh, to market. There's also different levels, of parts of P3s. You can do the design, build, finance. You can do a design, build, finance, maintain or design, build, finance, maintain, and operate. And so with the market sounding, you have to determine which is the best value for money, what will work for Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services and the, and the clients in determining that. And all of those things will, make it, will, will bleed into the decision with respect to how long that contract would be. I don't know if uh, there's any further. No, I think my, my team has said I've answered that. Thank you, Debbie. I'd like to follow, you mentioned a little bit that the delay in the South Edmonton Hospital is due to COVID, right? But we also saw that during COVID, um, we saw the government clearly indicate that infrastructure investment was a priority. It was a key part of their economic recovery plan, getting Albertans back to work, was to significantly invest in infrastructure. Um, and you know, we could argue about whether or not there were other things they should have included in their economic recovery plan. I won't do that now. But certainly, infrastructure was a top priority. But yet, you just indicated that COVID was a result, was a, the reason for the delay in the South Edmonton Hospital. So I'm trying to understand why, when the government was prioritizing infrastructure builds and economic recovery, for some reason, the South Edmonton Hospital actually was delayed as a result. Why was it not prioritized as something to include in the economic recovery plan? Why was it one of the projects that was actually delayed as a result of COVID and not actually uh, accelerated? So there's a couple of things to answer with respect to that. The investment in shovel-ready projects and capital maintenance and renewal and the other avenues such as the school maintenance renewal and some of the government properties were accelerated. And so it's not that the new Edmonton Hospital was delayed as a result. We had a delay with some of the clinicians. We are still working on other parts of the program that we could do without the physicians and without the nurses and without the others that were, were prioritizing some of the work on the pandemic. And so we did actually accelerate some other programs uh, that didn't involve healthcare workers at the time. And so we did try and make sure we delivered our capital project while we were respectful in some of the health authority elements that, that were needed. So I, I would say that the new Edmonton Hospital was delayed in the functional programming, not necessarily the planning of the site, not necessarily the site works and other pieces. So we were reprioritizing what we could do with respect to that. Thank you. So just to clarify, I mean, the South Edmonton Hospital was something that, you know, uh, when the former government, the NDP government was in place, I mean, the goal was there that it would be built by 2026 to serve the people in my constituency and surrounding constituencies by 2026. What is the estimated timeline now? Uh, because the last I heard, I believe, is 2030 um, for this hospital to be completed. What is the, what's the timeline now for infrastructure? Sure, please. Keep it to the 23B. Um, the honourable member's questions about the timelines uh, now, specifically are referring to forward-facing uh, policy declarations. Um, our, our job here today is to talk about the business plan in the year that's before us. Um, many of the questions uh, that the member is asking would be better suited for question period uh, today. So I think I would just rather focus on the business of public accounts in terms of the business plan from prior years, and maybe just stay away from forward-facing policy uh, questions. Thank you. You know, I, I always appreciate uh, Member Turton's willingness and efforts to keep us on track. Uh, and I'm sure that my colleague uh, from Edmonton White Mud uh, meant to ask uh, about planning dates uh, that were 
uh, in place during the 2020-2021 uh, fiscal year. So, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, if we look at the annual report. Um, for example, page 15 on health facilities uh, uh, contains, uh, by my read, just in half a page here, about four different references to uh, anticipated uh, timelines, and so that is within the annual report. So uh, if the Honourable Member is asking about anticipated timelines within uh, four projects referenced within the annual report as the South Edmonton Hospital is on page 14 uh, uh, is the reference to the functional programming um, then uh, it's within uh, it, it's in order so uh, uh, if the member uh, would like to proceed on that basis thank you madam chair so I'll, I'll, I'll restate my question so you know based on the, the fact that the South Edmonton Hospital is mentioned several times in the annual report with anticipated timelines what is the anticipated timeline either within the context of this fiscal year or currently for the completion of the South Edmonton Hospital so within the context of the fiscal year it was noted that the project is in the planning phase and the completion date is determined as the project progresses so it is determined when the contracts and the construction contract is awarded so, thank you. So, what can I tell my constituents in that this fiscal, the fiscal year under consideration? What was the expe expected timeline for that fiscal year? What can I tell my constituents? You can tell your constituents that the, the site works is active and well underway for, to be the future home of the South, South Edmonton Hospital, and the government is committed to making world-class accessible health care in that area. Uh, thank you, Deputy. We'll now move on to the government side for 15 minutes in the first rotation. Okay, yes, Mr. Oh, Chair. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the work you do. Uh, you know, building the infrastructure is really important for Alberta, and uh, it was the key uh, commitment for us uh, to build an infrastructure, and it was the part of the Alberta recovery plan. As the Ministry of Infrastructure is accountable for the long-term planning of provincial public infrastructure to support social programs and services. One of these responsibilities is to deliver K to grade 12 education facilities. Schools are very important to support strong communities. The continued investment into the construction and modernization of Alberta school infrastructure is essential for our growth, growing province, and I'm happy to see that this has been a main priority of this government. On page 16 of the annual report, it states that during the year, infrastructure invested $441.7 million in school building and modernization initiatives. In addition, it also states on page 17 that of the th 315 school projects approved under these initiatives, 247 were completed. So my first question is, how many school projects were completed in year 2021 and how many classroom spaces were created in that year? Thank you very much for the question. So since 2011, there have been 315 school capital projects that were approved, of which 247, as you note, have been completed as of March 31st, 2021. This includes 20 schools that were completed in the 2020-2021 school year. And that provided nearly 14,900 new and modernized student spaces. Some of the completed school projects include modernization of St. Francis High School in Calgary, providing 2,348 modernized school spaces, new construction of the Divine Mercy Catholic Elementary School in Edmonton, creating 600 student spaces, and new construction of the Northcott Prairie School in Airdrie, creating 700 new spaces. That's Thank you. Yeah. And for these completed projects, how many were completed on time and on budget? So for these projects, all 20 of the new school projects were completed on time or as expected through construction. 18 of the 20 projects were completed uh, on budget. Two of the projects are still pending a receipt of final costs from the school jurisdictions that did build them. Thank you. And on page 16, it indicates that the ministry had budgeted about 
616.1 million for school construction and the modular classroom program. Could you explain why $174 million were not spent? So the $174 million under expenditure was primarily due to a change in the project scheduling and cash flow requirements for various school capital projects that year. So revised cash flows occur for a variety of reasons, reasons, such as delays in receiving statements of final costs from school jurisdictions, perhaps some slower construction during parts, uh, slower progress during parts of construction as a result of weather or some unforeseen site conditions. Thank you. Page 11 of the annual report states that the ministry was active on an initiative to reduce lease space and decrease costs. So my question is, what initiative has infrastructure undertaken to reduce or better utilize government space in the past year? So infrastructure manages its portfolio according to its asset management plan, which guides facility strategic planning and management through the facility's life cycle. So the asset management plan includes principles of right-sizing the real estate portfolio, considering current and future needs, and optimizing utilization of assets. So infrastructures, uh, infrastructures projects align with the plan to achieve cost-effective functional space, a reduction of environmental footprint, and a long-term sustainability of, of our assets. So efforts to right-size the portfolio resulted in a 4% decrease in the total cost per occupant in government space from 2019 to 2021, going from 8,855 to 8,520 per occupant. As part of infrastructure's asset management plan, we actively review opportunities to better utilize government space, support ministry consolidations, and densify to government standards and facilitate the reduction of our leased office space footprint. So some notable projects during 2021 fiscal year include the Alberta Emergency Management Agency Provincial Operations Center project. This project optimized government-owned space to accommodate the Provincial Operations Center and the Muriel Stanley Venn Provincial Center in Edmonton. This investment replaced a proposed $122 million new capital project with a $6 million investment in an existing government-owned building. So this project commenced in October 2020 and was completed a year later in September of 2021 and providing the Alberta Emergency Management Agency with a modern and efficient space to respond to emergencies across the province. There was also the Com Commerce Place building modernization and Commerce Place is a core and strategic building within our inventory. The first phase of this multi-phase project be began in October of 2019 and was completed in April of 2021 at a cost of about $3 million. So it consolidated space for advanced education and realized a leaf space reduction of 6,470 square meters and an annual savings of approximately 1.8 million. In addition, we continue to develop mobile suites as an innovative alternative space option to reduce leased government space. So we have a mobile suite which opened in June of 2019 at the infrastructure building where mobile workers from infrastructure can use, utilize that space as their primary work location. It offers various work points from private offices to solar pods to, to drop on a drop-in basis and unassigned basis. And the resulting space savings are significant with 130 mobile workers using about a quarter of the space that comparable uh, resident local offices can use. The mobile suites were expanded in April 2021 and we've included them in Commerce Place. Thank you. And Chair, I'll pass my time to Emily Roswell. <clears throat> Thank you, and uh, welcome here today. Uh, obviously, the last few years, we were dealing with a global pandemic, and uh, but that's not the only issue that's been impacting us. Uh, um, oh, the opioid crisis has claimed thousands of lives in Alberta, many of which are struggling with addiction. That's why it's, uh, I truly believe it's uh, people who are struggling with addiction should receive the help they need. On page 16 of the annual report, it states that the recovery community program will establish multiple recovery communities for addiction treatment across Alberta, and that it was in the design stage in 2020-2021. I'm just wondering, um, could you give us an update on this program and which communities will benefit uh, uh, having these additional treatment centers built, and when are they expected to open? 
thank you for the question because we are very committed to making uh, more care accessible to people experiencing addiction and mental health challenges uh, and access to life-saving prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery resources. So supporting additional recovery-oriented solutions is a government priority, and so infrastructure is playing a key role in delivering those facilities, which will undoubtedly help many people. So the Recovery Communities Initiative will build facilities for people experiencing addiction and mental health challenges. And Alberta Health intends to open four recovery communities. Locations have been announced in Red Deer, Lethbridge, Blood Tribe, and Gunn. So the project is split into two streams. So stream one consists of the following three sites. So Red Deer, which is a 75 bed facility. Construction started in November 2021 and the project is scheduled to be completed in September of 2022. Lethbridge is a 50 bed facility. The construction contract was awarded in December of 2021 and construction of prefabricated modular buildings is occurring off-site now. Groundbreaking is scheduled for this spring and the project is on schedule to be completed in December of 2022. And Gunn is a 50-bed facility. The project is in the design stage and construction and completion dates will be determined as the project progresses. So the estimated cost of this stream is $55.7 million to complete the three sites. Stream 2 currently consists of the one site, the Blood Tribe, as well as providing increased capacity in Gunn. So the, the Blood Tribe site is currently in the planning stage. The estimated capital cost for Stream 2 are $35.8 million, for which new funding was provided and approved in Budget 2022. Now, <clears throat> those are uh, public places, right? Like those are all government-owned, even the Blood one? Right. Yeah. So the now community and social services, I'm assuming, is making those decisions. That is correct. Right? And the capital throws to them, to you, and then you build it. Yeah. Right? Frankly, yeah, that's exactly how it happens. We. We build what others in the service areas determine should be built. Okay. So then how do you, do you in any way, shape, or form uh, deal with the nonprofit area? Like there are a lot of nonprofits have built or raised, did fundraising locally and, and went and built facilities. So do you, do you probably, I, I guess my question, do you get involved with them? Do you help them out? You know? There, there are a couple of ways that that happens. Typically, they would work directly with the ministry that is involved, but we do have an unsolicited proposal process that we hit, we introduced in, as I mentioned in my opening statements, we have an, uh, an unsolicited proposal process for infrastructure projects from the privates or nonprofit sector. So that is a way for Albertans and other other or groups to pass on their good ideas and infrastructure investment opportunities to government through infrastructure. So we didn't have this mechanism before and now they can come to us with some of their ideas. So it does signal to the private sector and nonprofit groups that government is open to consider other ways to build infrastructure and have it financed. Um, it encourages the private sector and nonprofits to come forward with infrastructure projects and fill much needed infrastructure gaps. Uh, which government can't fill alone. And so we did have a USP that was approved this year and announced a, a center in Red Deer, which was for wraparound services for health, health centers. We paid for the servicing. Someone else is building the building. Yeah, so you don't get involved in the actual construction or... Well, not in that case because but, someone yeah. else has offered to buy it for us, but we will work with health services and children's services to, to occupy the space. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, Okay, good. I guess I'll uh, uh, see the rest of my time to MLA Lovely. Thank you so much, member, and uh, welcome everyone. Good to see you all here. On page 15 of the annual report, it states that the Fort McMurray Residential Facility-Based Care Centre, Willow Square, project was completed in January 2021 under budget despite delays due to flooding in April 2020. Uh, this facility includes places for long-term care, supportive living of various levels, and palliative care, and was a very important initiative to continue investing in health care facilities across Alberta to support the different needs of our population. Uh, so why was the location of the facility changed from where it was initially recommended to be built in Parsons Creek? So... After listening to concerns from the community about the site uh, of the Fort McMurray Residential Facility-Based Care Centre, government announced that the facility would be moved to Willow Square site from the original proposed 
Parsons Creek location. So some of the concerns about the Parsons Creek location included distance from, of the site from essential supports and services and the community's vision for a centrally located aging in place facility. Okay, and uh, what was the final cost of the Willow Square project? And did it increase at all because of changing the location? So the, this state-of-the-art facility cost $102 million. And with the 2015 decision to construct the facility at Willow Square location instead of the Parsons Creek site, it was estimated to cost an additional $30 million to build a 100-bed facility from a total of $50 million, so to $80 million, due to the site considerations and the need for flood mitigation. And subsequently, in 2016, infrastructure revised the estimated cost from 80 to 110 million after Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health reassessed the need and increased the facility to 144 beds, which included space for 36 beds that Alberta Health Services could add at a later date. So there were several decisions that changed the cost of the project, essentially the scope. Thank you so much. And I see that uh, the report of the Auditor General of November 2021 lists two outstanding recommendations for infrastructure regarding the Willow Square project to improve certain project management processes for capital projects. What is the infrastructure uh, doing to address these recommendations and what benefits are expected to be gained as a result of any actions taken? So the Auditor General recommended infrastructure improves project management processes as noted for capital projects and to improve performance measures. So five update sessions were held with the Auditor General's office team throughout the audit and I'm pleased to confirm that in February this year we've communicated as I mentioned that we have we believe we have fully implemented those recommendations. So in response to the first recommendation to improve certain project management processes for capital projects uh, infrastructure undertook a, a project delivery standardization initiative that targets enhancement uh, thank you, Deputy. We'll now move on to the second rotation, the official opposition for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. On page 11 of the report, it notes that the Ministry advanced a consistent and coordinated approach to priorities, capital maintenance and renewal spend. Uh, page 11 also notes that the Ministry was, and I quote, committed to protecting lives through COVID. Uh, but we have seen some failures in execution. We heard from Dr. Hinshaw when we met with Health last fall that her advice during the fiscal year in question was to improve ventilation in schools, for example. Uh, but we found out that just under a fifth of the total CMR spend for schools went to ventilation. Uh, when asked about this, the, the Chief Medical Officer of Health said all she could do was give advice. When the Ministry of Education came, they didn't really have satisfactory answers. So this department coordinates the CMR spend in a consistent way. I'm wondering why not spend capital maintenance and renewal money during a global pandemic on improving ventilation as the Chief Medical Officer of Health has directed? So thank you very much for this important question. Um, so we did highlight that there was an investment in capital maintenance and renewal spending in 2021 for infrastructure. There was a lot for uh, we had a budget of 77 million for government-owned facilities, 110 for for uh, health facilities. In infrastructure, we had 12 million dollars for school facilities because most of the CMR, which was over 100 million, 107 million, uh, for the in CMR was delivered by school boards, and so the, a lot of the investment was for the school boards to determine where they would spend uh, some of that money for the 107 million. But with that and the school HVAC, we are confident that all school authorities have been given the supports with, uh, needed to provide a safe world-class education to students during the previous and current school years. And in general, Alberta's position is that ventilation is one of the factors that has to be considered in the COVID spread, and the ventilation system should be well-maintained and functioning optimally. So general guidance recommends that HVAC systems should be maintained in accordance with the manufacturer's operating guidelines and updated as necessary. And Alberta is making significant investments in capital maintenance and renewal, which does frequently include HVAC upgrades. So in, as we mentioned, um, a significant amount of CMR was provided in accelerated funding to school boards, and the school divisions decide how best to spend each of these dollars. Um, we believe they spent about $44 million of that on HVAC and ventilation upgrades. The rest of the funding they did direct to other uh, CMR projects. 
Um, but I do want to highlight that the Alberta government, when we build the schools and, and when we do some maintenance, the, we follow the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers design and operation recommendations for school facilities in response to COVID. So for schools in design and construction, our government standards are required to meet those standards and uh, we do recommend ventilation designs for two, two stages of filtration in schools and both ventilation systems of either 100% of outside air or a mix of air ventilation are acceptable. And humidification systems must be developed. So we are building these in because they are to code. Um, the government's requirement for total air rates and air exchanges per hour are higher than the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineer requirements. There are no restrictions on using additional technologies for air filtration and sterilization, but it's the school board's decision to use and add them for schools in design and construction. So we can't comment on the decisions made by the school divisions with respect to their air filtration. Um, but the HVAC, we do encourage and, and recommend that the HVAC system be maintained in accordance with those standards. So did, did the department look at whether or not those standards were sufficient uh, to prevent the spread of, of COVID-19. I mean, those standards were developed, I, I assume, prior to the pandemic hitting us all. Was, was there any evaluation of whether or not the standards were sufficient to meet the challenge of the, of the day? So um, I do know that what we do, sorry, I'm gonna pass to one of my ADMs who has a little bit more technical knowledge, but we do confer a lot with the federal government and others around the codes and the requirements. They are not changing the codes to which we build. And therefore, we do rely on the experts federally and, and provincially to guide the codes and then we build to those standards. And with that, I don't know if, uh, Kathy, do you have any, any detail? And please introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Maniago. I'm the, exec uh, the Assistant Deputy Minister of Strategic Integration and Operations at Alberta Infrastructure. Um, we continue to monitor the standards um, and work with our federal partners and with the, the, uh, the American Society of Engineers as well, um, and are continuing to monitor their um, research on the standards, and we will continue to adapt as we need to as they adapt theirs. We don't have the, um, the capacity in-house to do those measurements inside, so we, we monitor what they're doing and we'll adapt as, as they change. So that, that leads on to my next question. Uh, page 26 and 27 of the annual report discusses infrastructure's objective to support vital public service delivery through effective long-term investments in core, ac uh, core assets. Section gives examples of CMR projects that enhance the safety and security in government-owned facilities. Uh, Alberta Public Service employees were ordered back to work uh, in offices in August of 2020 and then were sent home again in November of 2020 when COVID cases skyrocketed. I'm just wondering, what work did infrastructure do prior to employees returning to the office to evaluate the effectiveness of ventilation and filtration systems for preventing the spread of COVID in government spaces? So I'll start and then I'm going to ask uh, Dale Beasley or ADM of Properties to, to discuss this. But I will say that we actually follow the guidance of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Hinshaw, uh, with respect to where we work and, and some of the guidance around the buildings. But Dale, did you want to answer? Sure. Uh, to supplement the Deputy's comments, during um, the COVID, uh, during that year of COVID, we did have to maintain our buildings. And while a lot of people did work uh, from home, under the mandatory health order, which was CMH order 42, 2020, which was issued December 11th, 2020. Uh, we did have a number of people that couldn't work from home, uh, prison guards, social workers, lots of other people essential to the government services weren't able to. So what we did is we maintained our offices by enhancing our cleaning in high touch areas. Um, so there was lots of uh, services for that. Uh, we, also, um, we also had air quality testing and uh, ran through some of the buildings, not all of them. Uh, but where needed. But generally, we, we maintained a higher level of standards. We brought in a lot of uh, PPE. We had markers in our hallways around, um, you know, people maintaining six feet distance. But again, as the deputy said, we were also following um, the uh, public health orders. But uh, the, t the high touch areas would be like door handles, knobs, push bars, elevator buttons, panels, restrooms, and hand sanitizer. With, with due respect, uh, ADM, I, I mean, my question was about filtration. We know 
we knew early on that fomite transmission was not really significant when it came to preventing the spread of, uh, of, of COVID. So you, you mentioned that you did some air quality testing in, in some buildings. I, I mean, how widespread was air quality testing? Is that the right approach? I, I, I mean, you know, what engineering or public health expertise did the department do to evaluate whether or not, or, or to evaluate the risk of transmitting COVID in government spaces? Again, as the deputy mentioned, we did follow the advice of the public, uh, the chief medical officer of health for physical distancing and whatnot. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there was, um, people were supposed to come back in August 2020. So prior to people coming back in areas of high density or areas of concerns where the building standards maybe were older, we did bring in some, some areas where, where it was requested, where it was looked at in determining air quality tests for the buildings. We didn't find uh, any issues around that in terms of spread, but this was a very fluid situation at the time, and we worked with uh, the, the, the staff at Municipal Affairs at the time under any of the building codes. We took advice from the federal government, as the deputy pointed out. Um, we, we did what we could, but there wasn't, there wasn't a lot we were doing. It was a fluid situation, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't find any medical evidence that said that the testing the the, the air quality was, was related to COVID. We were just following the public health advice of the chief medical officer of health. Well, I, I mean, we did hear the chief medical officer of health tell this committee that in fact, she did provide advice to address ventilation and filtration in public buildings. Uh, so it's, it's disappointing to me that uh, either that advice didn't come in, in time or, or it wasn't heeded. I, I guess, during the period in fiscal 2020, 2021, when APS employees were working in office, how, what kind of systems to evaluate the COVID safety were in place? Again, we, we followed the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, enhanced cleaning, additional PPE, floor markers, and to be honest, the, the offices weren't that fully, fully, um, fully stocked, I guess. Like I was on a floor that would hold 85 people and there was six, so we just spread, we spread out. Uh, thank you. We'll now move to the government side for a 10-minute rotation, please. Well, thank you so much, um, Madam Chair. Um, before we uh, proceed, I, I just, uh, I know that we ran out of time before you uh, had a chance to finish your answer, but I just wanted to pause for a minute and um, and thank you so much for the investment that we've had in my community. Um, we do have a school that Chester Running Replacement School is now finished and open and the kids and teachers are in there working and enjoying that investment. And we have uh, an another new school that's going to be built this year um, uh, to, uh, to help out with OLMP, which is over capacity. And we also received the highest amount of uh, money that the city of Camrose has ever received with the wastewater treatment plant which is uh, currently being upgraded. So, I, and, and not just the community of Camrose, uh, but the constituency has received a large amount of investment money and my community is very grateful for this investment. So I just wanted to pause and thank you so much for that. Um, but uh, the time ran out and I'll just go back because uh, there's been quite a bit of conversation um, that's happened. And so just a reminder, so I, I had uh, mentioned, I see that the report of the Auditor General, November 2021 lists two outstanding recommendations for infrastructure regarding the Willow Square project to improve certain project management processes for capital project. And then I asked, what is infrastructure doing to address these recommendations? And what benefits are expected to be gained as a result of any actions taken? So thank you. And I will pass your thanks on to the team that, that coordinates the buildings uh, of the schools. Um, in response to the first recommendation that the Auditor General made, which was to improve certain project management processes for capital projects, Infrastructure has undertaken a project delivery standardization initiative that targets enhancement and alignment of key project management processes, governance, and tools. This promotes a more consistent approach and clear expectations for project delivery. And so to address this recommendation, we've implemented a project management plan, policy, and accompanying guidelines, as well as a manual to help guide the creation and maintenance of the plan. The package includes a project charter, schedule, risk register, financial management tool, and issues log. There are project gate meetings that have also been established, as well as improved reporting and data quality using the two main reporting tools we have in infrastructure. And in response to the second recommendation to improve performance measures for capital projects, 
The tracking and reporting of performance is a key component to successful management and delivery of the capital projects. And to this end, the department developed leading and lagging indicators by leveraging data sources and reporting um, to s uh, good performance metrics. We supply these performance metrics through, through our detailed data. And now we have in our uh, reports, in our business plan, new performance measures that are whether projects are on time and on budget. So the department has documented these processes and is using the new reporting and the review and the alert tools to signal when something is perhaps not on time and on budget. So we will continue, continue to explore and develop changes to its project management system with focus on continuous improvement. So for us, what, what we will see out of this is more consistency in our project delivery, uh, a repository of lessons learned which will help inform future projects. And for us, there's clear transparency now on our project measurement on, on time and on budget. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the, uh, the full answer. And we'll pass the rest of my time now back to my colleague, MLA Roosevelt. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about, like on page 11, the annual report states that the ministry released an updated uh, public-private partnership framework and a new unsolicited proposal framework. Now, you've talked about that a, a little bit. And I know um, when, when I have mayors or Reeves or people come to me and they're, they're very good at, uh, you know, I'll get money from this government and that government and whatever, like that's kind of their mindset, right? And I bring up private uh, partner, uh, uh, public-private partnerships. And they say, well, who would do that, right? <laughs> and. Uh, it's just that like no one has that concept uh, solidly in their in their mind. So, um, can you explain what unsolicited proposals are, uh, and what was the government hoping to achieve with both of these new frameworks? And just maybe expand a little bit into who the private part of this typically is, if if that's in your area of responsibility. It, it is in our area of responsibility to coordinate. Again, as we mentioned in our last question, I usually coordinate, but we do work with our partners if it's a health project or something else we involve Alberta Health. But an unsolicited proposal, or we call it a USP on occasion, if we use an acronym, we're sorry, um, is a proposal for an infrastructure project initiated by, initiated by the private sector. So in the past, Albertans uh, didn't have the chance we're missing out on potentially good ideas that about infrastructure investment opportunities because the government didn't have a mechanism in place to hear them or consider submissions from the private sector or nonprofits. So the USP framework signals to the private sector that the government is open for business and is interested in private infrastructure investment opportunity in the, in the province. So it encourages the private sector to come forward with infrastructure projects and fill in much needed infrastructure gaps. So USPs uh, may include investment ideas, they could inv include technologies or strategies to provide infrastructure, such as public transportation, health, education facilities, housing, or irrigation infrastructure. And so, um, just to give you an idea, we've received uh, to date 13 unsolicited proposals, four in the year in which it was introduced, uh, worth multi, -million, multi billions of dollars. We've received um, six ideas for health projects four for transportation and rail, including some that are public, like the Edmonton uh, Calgary High Speed Rail Project, the Calgary Banff Rail Projects. In edu education, we received two uh, proposals, and we had uh, one which was a re energy retrofit, just to give an idea of the types of projects that are coming forward. Um, Alberta's public-private partnership framework and guideline is intended to be used as a guide to assessing capital projects for potential public-private partnership procurement and after the appropriate approvals in procuring a capital project as a P3. So it outlines our principles for P3s to be transparent and assessing and the assessment and procurement principles for them. So we just want everybody to know um, how we're gonna operate in this space. So the P3 principles are consistent with and should be uh, considered alongside Alberta's capital planning manual, which guides the capital planning process. Um, so those are really what we're trying to do is make sure we're open and transparent and demonstrate we're open for ideas for needed public infrastructure. And, and can you give an example, I don't need names or anything, but of uh, who, who would the private be? Like what would, would it be a pension fund or 
or what? Where does that money come from? Um, I, I can start. We've, we've had things from pretty much a number, like all sorts of areas, but uh, Mr. Beasley can probably give you examples as he's leading Sure. This. I'll give you a good illustrative example. So a group would, in a smaller community outside of Edmonton, would uh, say fundraise to build supports to support vulnerable uh, women or youth. And they got some land donated to them. Uh, they have some uh, local community leaders that have raised some money successfully and they need, they're just short one thing. And in, in the case that we approved, it was uh, servicing, servicing to the new building that was going to be built. So um, they approached the government asking for some money. Um, we looked at it uh, to make sure that our partners who are across ministry work agreed with this. So that would be Children's Services, Health, Alberta Health Services, CSS. Assuming they were okay with it, we would ensure this wasn't part of the capital plan and we provided them with some money. But we also, as we go into these processes, want to make sure that they had adequate funding. So we had to make sure we had risk mitigation strategies in place to show that, yeah, they've, they've secured the funding they need. They've secured the land they need, and, and in this case, we had success. We, and as the deputy mentioned, we've had many other pr uh, processes that are just early on that require more regulatory um, things, regulatory uh, hurdles to be overcome, such as building a high-speed rail when you have to deal with jurisdictional issues with First Nations land, uh, say federal land for airports. So there's no real limit to it, but we have had success in one area, and we do form these committees, as I mentioned, to, uh, to look at these. And, and if the proposal isn't something that's in the public interest of Albertans, we would then tell the proponent this is not the right form, but maybe there's another way you can approach the government for funding. And to be clear, I just want to be, this is not a backdoor in. If you require public funds, it does go through the capital planning process. So it's, um, it's just a way for others to come to the table with ideas and innovative ways to deliver infrastructure that we can consider. But it, there's a lot of due diligence before something's accepted. Yeah, no, fair enough. I, uh, I just know locally there's a, like a hockey rink. <laughs> they want to build a hockey rink and, and it's well, where would private money come from for that? So, um, you know, if they want a suggestions, maybe they'll come in and have a chat and, and go down that path. We're always open to speak with proponents and outline how the process works. Okay. I appreciate that. That uh, gives me a, uh, a feel for where everything goes. So, very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move to the third rotation for the official opposition, 10 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my first question, uh, key objective 1.4 states that infrastructure completed guidelines for the design of barrier-free washrooms in public buildings to ensure accessibility. Um, can you list the, all of the, and, and you might not have this information, you can certainly table it, that'd be great. Can you list the infrastructure buildings and facilities that have adopted these guidelines? Thanks, we're very proud of having the guidelines, but I do not believe we have the full listing of buildings. I'm looking. No, we don't, but we can provide that in writing if you like. And would you also be able to table the guidelines noted in the objective? We can certainly table the guidelines. Great. When the ministry evaluates infrastructure, public buildings owned or leased to meet objective 1.4, which is account for the evolving needs of Albertans by designing future infrastructure delivered projects that are inclusive and adaptable. Can you describe the work undertaken to identify, remove, or prevent barriers to the built environment? Now, this will include, but is not limited to washrooms. And can you tell me who within your ministry is responsible for that? So we have a couple of things that we do to ensure that we honor uh, the guidelines around barriers. We have um, some, I'm gonna talk about schools specifically for now, but, but we can broaden this as well, in that we do have space that, like we, when we build the design standards, the, the school standardization, we standardize areas such as classrooms, science rooms, gymnasium, and libraries. And, and we, we standardize the space and the programming requirements to ensure that they are barrier free. And um, we do have some things that are not standardized in a school, but that's more related to the site, like the site size, shape, slope, and others. But what we also do to ensure that we are honoring the requirements around barrier free access is we do post-occupancy evaluations um, to obtain feedback on the building's performance. And it does include whether we have um, barrier-free access or not, or maybe somebody's put a photocopier where they shouldn't and those types of things to make sure that, you know, a hallway is, is large enough uh, to meet all the needs. So we have completed close to 50 uh, post-occupancy evaluations with, with groups since 2013. 
Uh, we've chosen projects that are schools and government facilities like courthouses to make sure they are barrier free. Um, there's no matter what the typology of project, the program, um, we do get assessments from those that use, use the sites, urban, suburban, rural areas, and we do test to make sure that the design as we envisioned it for barrier free is actually um, in place. Creating barrier free, as I'm sure you all are experts, but creating bar barrier free environments are, are, is complex. Yeah. So there is a lot more to it than a photocopier in the hallway or a bathroom. And so I'm wondering if you could tell me within the ministry, number one, who is responsible for this work? And is there a framework or an evaluation tool that your ministry uses to do a systematic review of the barrier free status or recommendations? So we have a couple of people that are very interested. I didn't mean to, to marginalize or, or downplay what it is. I was just giving you some, some examples that are quite visual. But uh, Dale can speak to, to what we're doing in this space as well. We do have a technical design team that does ensure uh, some of the, the barrier-free access is, is there. So in addition to working with our technical teams, we do, of course, work with the Provincial Barrier Free Administrator under the uh, Ministry of Municipal Affairs. We do consult with uh, that person, uh, she in this case, uh, around that. We do make sure that we are uh, up to date on the national building codes. And as buildings are, as you know, are retrofitted like public retrofits, if the retrofits go beyond a certain percentage, we do have to bring those to codes. But as we do look at retrofitting buildings, government owned that we're in our control, uh, we would look for barrier free. Also, when we do leases, we also look as requirements into leases to have those spaces. So uh, both washrooms, both accessibility. Uh, one thing, fortunately, during COVID is we have installed a lot more uh, wave doors uh, in buildings that we, we previously hadn't. They're not necessarily barrier free, but they have become very handy for those that have mobility issues. Okay, um, thank you for that. So I have a, a question for you. So, oh, actually going back, so you didn't answer, is there a framework or an evaluation tool that your ministry uses, like a standard evaluation tool or framework? Now I know there's building codes which are a minimum standard and barrier free is not that. So is there a, a framework that your ministry uses and you know you can think about that and table that if possible. That'd be interesting to see. So I'm going to go back to um, the key highlights on page 11. Now it states that your ministry conducted a public engagement or public engagement activities on the proposed Alberta Infrastructure Act and 20-year strategic capital plan. So prior to the release of this work, I'm wondering if you could describe the consultation that was undertaken by your ministry to ensure that your work was barrier free or was, you know, was at the standard of universal design? So when we consulted on the development of the Infrastructure Accountability Act, the act reflects input from several uh, areas of Alberta. So between June and August of 2020, we received 3,172 total survey submissions and 56 written submissions, including input from various sectors. Energy, healthcare, schools, municipality, construction, post secondary, uh, community recreation and transportation. Were there any disability specific groups, or perhaps, you know, there is a legislated body that yeah. is supposed to provide advice to government, and that's the Premier's Council on the yeah. Status of People with Disabilities. So I'm just wondering was there any, um, any advice seeking or any consultation with disability specific groups or the Premier's Council? So I can get back to whether they provide any response. Everybody was welcome to participate. It was not a closed consultation, it was an open consultation. <laughs> so the, just so I'm clear, just that there was no deliberate sort of. I, I want to get back to you on that okay. uh, with respect sure. to that, that but I also good. would say that the 20 year strategic uh, capital plan and the Infrastructure Accountability Act are very principle based. And so they do actually have princip principles of inclusion, principles of ensuring infrastructure is available for all Albertans. And so because it's so high level, it does include a lot of uh, inclusive language. I look forward to your tabling. Yeah. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. So on outcome two, performance metrics 2A and 2B, measures are reported on a one year lag, meaning results for 2020, 21 are actually results from 2019, 20, the year prior. These are two of the only three performance metrics included for this outcome. So can the ministry comment on the accuracy of this metrics, given the fact that they're not relevant for the time frame reported in the annual report? Could you repeat, please, which measures you're looking at? 
Uh, outcome two, performance metrics 2A and 2B measures are reported on a one-year lag. I don't have the page number for you, though. I'm just trying to get there, if you don't mind. So this is on the office density. And so the, uh, the both, actually, most of the measures that are in here are actually lagging measures. Uh, and so it is just to get the best information that we have available um, at the time, and that's the, the intent of, of the report. But with respect to the office equipment, Dale, did you have anything? Um, the, the, only, the reason, one of the reasons for the delay is just it's the complexity of the data collection. It's just, it's just there's a lot of data, there's a lot of things to process. Um, a lot of it's manual, um, so it does take it does take time. Over a number of years, you would see you know trends still, but we did we did want we did feel it was transparent of us to acknowledge the one year lag in the annual report. I acknowledge the transparency, but but why not present? I mean undertake whatever work to present results for the year in which the results are achieved. So it seems, um, I don't know, it, it seems unusual to have this, this sort of information that is really a year behind. We're always striving for, sorry, we're always striving for continuous improvements in our systems and we do take the point. Uh, we are always looking to enhance our, our abilities and our reporting around this. Hopefully one day we would get to that, but uh, but right now we're just we're just not quite there. So I do take your point. Okay, I'm going to switch gears and get cut off, but I'm going to ask about the Lethbridge Hospital. So on page 16, you note an investment in the Redger Hospital, including cardiac catheterization and lab, but this is not the only health region region that needs a cath lab. In fact, there's been an analysis that the Lethbridge Hospital may need this facility more urgently. So AHO South Zone has cited this. Um, as an urgently pressing need, so has the City of Lethbridge Council. So can you share your planning and costing for the facility in Lethbridge? So I don't know if I have anything specific to Lethbridge, but I will highlight that it's Alberta Health that makes the decision uh, based on needs assessment with Alberta Health Services as to which uh, programs move forward on the capital plan. So there's a detailed needs assessment that's done provincially to then prioritize the work and then uh, we get involved with the functional pro programming and, and other pieces. Um, so it is Alberta Health Services that provides the capital submission and the needs assessment and then the delivery of the business case. And it's at that point that you would get the assessment onto the capital plan. I'm just seeing if you have anything on the Lethbridge, but I don't believe you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to get back to P3s and the uh, USBs uh, as well a bit. Um, what are the uh, like? What are the significant changes made to the new framework and uh, and guidelines compared to what was done previously? So, with that, I'm going to speak um, to the P3s. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to. Um, the P3 framework, I think, is a bit clearer on what, uh, sorry, the P3 partnership and guideline, as we said, it's a guideline to assess capital projects for, for P3 partnerships. And um, what we did is we learned from what we had done before, and so we wanted to be very clear that a P3 approach is the preferred option for any major capital projects. Uh, so that transparency was key. And, but only if it shows value in doing so. So we also expanded the P3 definition to allow other alternative financing opportunities beyond the typical design, build, finance, maintain, or the design, build, finance, operate model. So again, to allow some flexibility and some innovation in that space. But again, the premise, which has stayed the same, is it must show, building this way, it must show value for, for Albertans. With respect to the USP framework, that was a new framework introduced in 2020, and therefore there were it's completely new, so the entire thing is... is so five years old, they last, what changed? Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's my understanding that the infrastructure uh, started planning uh, in 2020-21 to deliver five new school projects through a public-private um, partnership. What was achieved in 2021, and how did these activities relate to the P3 framework? So in, in that year, the ministry assessed a bundle of five high schools for P3 delivery. So in September 2020, uh, we invited industry to submit qualifications to deliver the schools through a public-private partnership. 
And in November 2020, government shortlisted three qualified groups to deliver the project. So in the fall, uh, the P3 contract was award of 2021, the, the contract was awarded to Concert Bird Partners to design, build, and finance the five new high schools, uh, one each located in Black Falls, Langdon, Leduc, oh, and, and two in Edmonton. So one is the, the construction on the southeast uh, high school in Edmonton began in this year, and the construction on the other four schools is expected to be begin uh, in the spring or summer. Sorry, the Edmonton Hospital began in the fall of 2021. So all five high schools are expected to be completed in 2024 and have 7,000 spaces. Uh, the delivery of these high schools follows that P3 uh, guideline and framework. And the use of the model to deliver these schools, we think will save Albertan taxpayers about $114.5 million. When compared to the cost of delivering and maintaining the schools over a traditional uh, approach. And we think Alberta has a, a successful track record of delivering much needed school infrastructure using P3s. And this, pr this process, once again, uh, can demonstrate this is the best method for providing communities with new schools quickly and in a cost effective way. Thank you. I'll cede the rest of my time to MLA Singh. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to thank the representative of the Infrastructure Ministry for being with us today, as well as the Office of Auditor General. My questions are about the policies of the ministry related to the surpluses properties of the government. And on page 27 of the annual report explains that the infrastructure disposes of surplus properties for the government of Alberta, which proceeds from the separate sales retained to the government's general revenue fund. It also states that 8.9 million in proceeds were generated from the sale of 14 parcels of surplus land. And what kind of analysis is conducted when declaring properties surplus? Thank you for the question. So a property is declared surplus um, when it's no longer being used by a program. So infrastructure then circulates it to all ministries to see if they need the property. And if so, we'll review the program needs and confirm whether the surplus property matches with the, the program area requirements. And if a property can be used, we keep it. It's retained by the, by the government of Alberta. But if it's not required, it follows circula and following circulation, it's deemed to be surplus for government purposes. And so then we, we surplus it. Thank you for answering. And how can Albertans be sure that infrastructure is getting maximum value when these assets are sold? So when a property is declared to be surplus for government purposes, the property is first offered to the local municipality for municipal purposes as well. Um, so if a municipality uh, chooses to purchase the site, it's typically at market value. Uh, if a municipality declines, the property is listed for public sale at market value with a realtor and posted on the MLS or the multiple listing service site and on infrastructure's property site for sale. And so it is done through the market. Thank you for answering. And it also states on page 27 that the ministry was developing a new policy that would have infrastructure managing the disposal of all, all surplus properties for government as well as most acquisition. Can you tell us about the progress made on this policy in 2020 and 2021? So, so thank you. This, this policy is an intent to streamline um, the acquisition and, and disposal process. So on December of 2020, in December of 2021, Cabinet approved a new acquisition surplus and disposal policy which centralizes government's acquisitions and sales of real estate within infrastructure property division starting April of this year, so in the next week. Uh, an enhanced website has also been developed for users. So the disposal of surplus properties reduces operating costs and increases cash proceeds for government and a centralized approach can lead to cost efficiencies in administering the program. So we are increasing our revenue generation and ideally reducing the red tape opportunities. So in short, the benefits of the new uh, policy include shortened timelines for properties to move to sale and reduce carrying costs. So there's also clarity over roles and responsibilities and reducing the administrative processes. Thank you, Deputy, and all the staff um, of the Ministry for answering 
all my questions and I really appreciate you all for coming today. And with that, I will cede my time to Emily Tetton. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, um, everyone, for coming out here today. You know, most of my questions I was going to ask actually pertain to the amazing writing of cameras, but I think their MLA is doing such a great job. She asked most of them already, but uh, uh, just as a, yeah, I, I think it's an amazing writing. I think she, Emily Lovely is doing a great job. But even more than the amazing writing of cameras, what I want to talk about is something I know many members here and across the floor are very interested in, and that's red tape, because I know... Obviously, we have to talk. You know, I hear the calls from across the floor. I mean, this is something I know that many residents in Spruce Grove and Stony Plain and Edmonton Gold Bar are looking for. So my first question has to deal with page 11 uh, of the annual report. It states that infrastructure completed the development of its three-year plan for red tape production to identify legislation, policies, forms, guidelines, and processes that were all deemed administratively burden burdensome for stakeholders. It also states that infrastructure exceeded that year's annual red tape reduction target of 12% and was on track to achieve the, gov achieve the government's 33% reduction target in three years, which I think everyone will say is a fantastic achievement. So I guess my first question is, uh, what are some of the main achievements of the red tape reduction initiatives in infrastructure during the fiscal year that we're talking about here today? Thank you for the question. Uh, the red tape reduction is a key initiative for infrastructure as it is across government. So we identified roughly 2,000 opportunities for red tape reduction in 2019. And thank you for saying we have exceeded our reduction targets uh, set for the 1920 and 2021 fiscal year. So what we accomplished in the year, um, there's a lot of initiatives that contributed to the success and of reducing regulatory and administrative burden. Some are actually the simplified uh, transportation utility corridor application process by developing a single electronic application form for requesting TUC access. We adopted the use of electronic signatures for all leasing agreements, which saves on courier servicing and printing. It may seem small, but it's actually quite a, quite an, uh, a jump for us. Um, and we have improved infrastructure's technical resource, technical resource site, which is ongoing and makes things a lot more user-friendly for people that, w that we work with. We've accelerated the approval process for post-secondary institutions' land disposition by changing the order in council approval requirements to a ministerial order approval requirement. And we have simplified the rural property sales appraisal policy by removing the requirement to undertake an external property appraisal if the internal appraisal is within 15% of the last external appraisal. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the fourth rotation. Uh, official opposition. I'm looking at Member Pancholi, who has the floor right now, Honourable Members. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you uh, to the officials. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, a few questions about schools, and specifically in the uh, annual report, uh, the annual report indicates that 315 schools have been approved since 2011, which is a kind of an odd timeline because, of course, that period of time covers about five different premiers. So I wonder if the deputy can be a little bit more specific and say how many of the schools... Um, were approved and funded between 2015 and 2019 and then finished and open since. And you don't have, if you don't have that information handy right now, if you could actually table that information. So that's the number of approved and funded schools between 2015 and 19 and which ones were opened and finished after that time. Um, I'll continue, or go ahead. I actually do have the listing. I'm just trying to find it. So um, we use the, it seems like an odd time period, but it's just 10 years. So it's, it's not any surprise to the 10 years. We've used it consistently in infrastructure. But for, we do have some schools. Uh, I, I actually think it's best probably to table which ones are completed. I do have a, a table. I don't want to read it out. Thank you. I appreciate Thanks. that. That would be very helpful <laughs> given the time constraints. So um, with respect to the P3 schools that uh, you know are, they're looking at building or have been built, um, I'm imagining that you must have some sense of the cost of of, tr of building a school through a traditional financing model versus a P3 model, um, and by school type, obviously different school sizes. Uh, do you have that? If, again, if you don't have that information at your fingers, if you could table that information. I don't, but when we do the comparison, you've also got to consider the maintaining component. So we will have what we have for the infrastructure components around building, but we, we will have, we do have 
on average what it takes for a high school, a junior high school, and an elementary school, and then what we use that for the assessment against our, our value for money on the P3. So certainly, so if you could table that analysis, that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, do P3 schools uh, typically include a playground? All schools right now get a grant for a playground, so, so all the approved schools, I believe, have a grant for $250,000 for a playground. Is that I, I th I'd like my ADM of Capital Projects to come talk about that, please. He he'll correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Uh, Gassan Al-Shazli, ADM for Capital Projects and Infrastructure. So Alberta Education provides grant uh, funding up to $250,000 per school uh, to support the construction of uh, playgrounds for eligible projects. Uh, for school communities that, that wish, um, if the number is to exceed $250,000, uh, uh, then, then usually the school jurisdictions would utilize something like fundraising to supplement the project. The decision actually lies within uh, Alberta Education in conjunction with the school jurisdictions. And uh, accordingly, then once the decision is made, we build the schools according to what, it, what, uh, what the decisions are. So thank you, if I may then, just to confirm, so that would seem to suggest that uh, each school built since 2019 includes a playground. Does $250,000 in your you know, expertise, does that cover the cost of a playground? Uh, no, I, don't, I mean, I cannot actually comment on okay. specifically a list of long, a long, a long list of schools since 2019, but we can definitely look into that and, and get back to you. Uh, as far as the coverage is, it's, itself is concerned, when we're estimating the overall project, uh, uh, since that's the allowance, uh, we have to understand that you're looking at an overall budget, budget for the entire school. So um, if it does exceed, then, then we, do, we do notify, uh, as we're doing the estimates for, for, the, uh, for Alberta uh, education, and uh, notify them accordingly, and then they deal, deal with the idea of uh, you know, uh, discussing it with the school jurisdiction as to whether fundraising is required to augment or not. So thank you. If you could table with this committee then, you know, an assessment of how many of the schools built since 2019-20 have playgrounds and how many do not yet have playgrounds and, you know, ultimately trying to get an idea of how much parents do have to personally fundraise. That's really what it is. It's parents fundraising to make up the cost to build a playground on those schools. Um, so I thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and so there was five high schools that were mentioned within the annual report um, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, I think they were either planned or they were, they were being built. Um, and I was wondering if the deputy can give us a cost comparison between the P3 and traditional financing for the five high schools. As you've said repeatedly, the P3 model has to make sense, right? You have to have a value for money comparison for the full build. Um, and not including the grounds, not just the buildings, because a high school isn't a high school, of course, as we know, without the sports pitches, the parking lots, all those other pieces. So can you give us a full cost comparisons for the five high schools? Uh, and if you don't have that available, of course, table. I do. With this committee. I have that. So the um, contract with the success successful P3 proponent was still finalized in September of 2021. The concert group partners had the lowest bid price at $300 million of a net present value. And so for us, compared to the traditional build and the maintenance, that's a savings of more than $114 million. Uh, compared to our estimate of 414 million net present value to do the same work. Um, the savings were actually validated by an independent accounting firm. That's how we do it. Uh, the other thing that I do have is I do have the schools announced through 2015 uh, onward. There were actually no schools in 2015. I have the school capital announcements for 2017, phase four. There were 26 projects that were announced in budget 2017 and two more projects that were subsequently approved in the fall of 2017 for a total of 28. The school capital announcement in 2018 had original uh, 20 projects, one was approved for design only and then got the construction later. And then the school capital announcements for 2019, there was originally 25 projects which included two for design only and then subsequently approved. And those were the Auburn May Middle School in Calgary and the Coventry Hill High School in Calgary as well. So that will give you the numbers. 
Thank you. And, and you did mention that uh, you had an independent analysis done on the cost uh, benefit. If, if, would you be able to table that uh, analysis with the, with the committee? We can give you the analysis of the overview we typically do for all P3 evaluations. We do have an, an accounting firm that assists us with the net present value assessments. Thank you. So you, that was a confirmation. We can t you can table that with the committee. Thank you. Um, I just quick question. Um, just going back to new school builds um, from 2019. Um, including the fiscal year under consideration. How many of those new school builds or modernizations included uh, creation of childcare spaces? That I do not believe I have detail on right now, unless my team does. No, we don't, but we will get that for you in writing. Thank you. I appreciate like. that. I'll turn it over to my colleague, the member from Edmonton Gold Bar. Thank you very much. Uh, government operates the Swan Hills Treatment Center, which is mentioned on page nine, uh, with correspondence that I've received from the department, it looks like the Swan Hills Treatment Center operation is going to be phased out by 2025. How many people does the facility employ and what will be the impact to the town of Swan Hills when that facility closes? So the Swan Hills facility um, is operated by a contractor and therefore uh, the uh, labor ebbs and flows. But um, for for us, the change in operating model was key because yearly cost to the province, the net cost to us to operate the centre, had increased to a subsidization of $30 million a year. So we have to manage the province's buildings and facilities in a cost-effective manner to ensure the best value of taxpayers. So with that, there was the decision, um, you know, there's the federal regulation, requires the end of the use of high-concentration polychlorinate biphenyls, sorry, the, the high concentration PCBs uh, by December of 2025. And that's what Swan Hills was built for and it's very expensive to use for other things. So if we are not um, abolishing the high concentration PCBs, uh, it's something that we do have to evaluate whether it's cost effective uh, to and, run. And, and I appreciate that. Our government has a lot of experience uh, shutting down uh, uh, facilities, but we also put in place transition, just transitions for the workers who are impacted. What plans does infrastructure have to provide a just transition for the workers at the Swan Hill Treatment Center? So I, I might get Mr. Beasley to assist me in answering, but one of the pieces that we have is actually a very long notification and transition period in that this was noted uh, earlier on that we would be ending um, production in December 2025 or 2026. We will follow whether the federal government um, changes any of the, the rules, but uh, Mr. Beasley does have some more information. Yeah. As the deputy mentioned, um, we do have mostly contracted staff, but if you're asking for the number, it's approximately 60 people, six zero. Okay, but no no plan to, trans, to, to find other employment for those folks or, uh, uh, you know, have a, have a transition plan for the community of Swan Hills that will have obviously be impacted when that facility closes down. We'll, we'll continue to work with the community, but as we mentioned, this is a, a, con, a contractual arrangement, so uh, it's a large, um, a large uh, consulting firm or a large contractor that does this. They would be then be working with their employees. Uh, uh, thank you. So this is fourth rotation government side, 10 minutes is the last rotation. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and, and then again, also thank you again for coming out here today. Um, you, you know, the, one of the few things that's better than talking about either the riding of cameras or one session on red tape reduction is the second set of questions on red tape reduction. So I'm looking forward to kind of continuing my line of questioning that I have. So, um, Mary, I, I know you started talking about some of the main achievements of the red tape reduction initiatives and infrastructure. I was just hoping you can maybe elaborate and finish your answer specifically about what are some of the, what's some of the feedback that uh, you receive by stakeholders. So generally, stakeholders are supportive of infrastructure's initiatives to better align practices with industry across government and to improve efficiencies and cost savings. The concept of electronic signatures has been out in industry for a while, so it's been extremely well received. Um, they're also quite supportive of the ministry's focus on streamlining, simplifying, and standardizing forms and processes in an effort to reduce red tape. It makes things simpler. So we find that our stakeholders specifically are mainly seeking consistency and standardization in our procurement and our project delivery processes as well. Uh, that's our, ind our industry liaison council and others are our main stakeholders and those that help us build projects. So they are very interested in, in, in that side of the house as well. 
Excellent. And uh, I mean, obviously, a key metric to red tape production is that there has to be a quantifiable benefit to it, either to taxpayers, either on a quicker pace of construction or also lower costs. So given the complexity of the, of the procurement process for government-funded infrastructure, I guess my, my main question is, what type of progress has the government made with reducing red tape so that those you know, taxpayers can receive greater value by those efficiencies that you, uh, that you have found or realized? So some of the more complex efficiencies that we are starting to reap the rewards are on things in our procurement like category management uh, to improve and expedite procurements. And so this is a strategy where the services we purchase are grouped into common categories for more efficient and effective acquisition. So by using category management, we've been able to engage the required services with shorter lead times and with vendors who meet common department standard qualifications and experiences. So three category management strategies currently in use um, are pre-qualified requests, bulk contracts, and multi-contract requests for proposals. So we use uh, the pre-qualification requests for specific categories containing a list of vendors that meet certain qualifications. So once they're qualified, they're only required to submit a price submission to the ministry each time we issue a statement of work. So we know they're qualified, they can deal with price. Bulk contracts are used for smaller limited risk work where one vendor is engaged under a bulk contract instead of issuing several small contracts to multiple vendors. The same as PQRs or the, or the uh, pre-qualification request, multiple vendors are pre-qualified for various categories, therefore allowing bulk packages to be issued under pricing requests again. And then multi contract request for proposal issues, we issue one RFP for multiple projects requiring scope of work from services. So vendors provide a single qualification proposal again with multiple fee proposals. So one for each separate contract. So the qualifications are then evaluated once um, and then they're applied to separate projects. So another uh, initiative that's been very successful by the Ministry to reduce red tape were revisions to our procurement for total property management. Again, not the building of construction, but the maintenance and, and property management. Again, we use pre-qualification requests to evaluate proposals, and uh, we've really reduced the administrative burden for the total property management contracts and the vendors submitting proposals. So infrastructure is now able to evaluate qualifications for each shortlisted vendor only once as opposed to multiple times. And the vendors who make the short lift list will now only have to submit pricing rather than a full submission, and thereby saving them time and effort. And this allows us to complete projects quicker and potentially lower cost. And the one thing I will add, it has not impacted uh, the number of contractors that are local and come from Alberta. The most, most of our contracts still uh, are with Alberta companies. So, well, thank you very much for uh, the response. And um, you know, before I see to um, to my good friend Emily Jackie Armstrong Hominick, I also just want to um, uh, appreciate the question put forth by the member from Edmonton White Mud about playgrounds at schools. I know in my writing there was a school built about six years ago when the previous government was there, and it was an elementary school, and they went for almost six years without a playground uh, at that school because it wasn't included. So I am thankful that that change has happened uh, moving forward to allow kids uh, the ability just to play, you know, and have a healthy, a robust um, uh, upbringing. So anyways, thank you very much for your question. I'd like to see the rest of my time to Emily Jackie Armstrong Hominick. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Um, on page four of the annual report, it states that infrastructure would continue to work with federal partners to have locally identified priority projects approved under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, or ICIP, and underway as quickly as possible. And I just want to mention, I'm grateful that in my riding, the amazing riding of Fort Saskatchewan Vegarville, there have been a few recipients of the ICIP funding. One of them is the town of Vegarville and the Agri-Food Industrial Park. This park will attract agricultural value-added companies to the area, providing many local jobs. And in Fort Saskatchewan, there is the Fort Saskatchewan Smart Fair and Smart Bus Program. An interesting fact, the Smart Fair is an account-based electronic fare payment system. This program is, a pilot, is being pilot tested in Fort Saskatchewan and the Edmonton region, but not extending as far to Camrose at this point. So question for you, how much funding was allocated under the program to invest in Alberta infrastructure and how much was received in 2020, 2021? Thank you. Um, through ICIP, Alberta has been allocated 3.66 
billion by the federal government to invest in uh, infrastructure projects that strengthen the economy and build resilient communities. So the funding was distributed across five streams. So public transit is 1.8 billion, green infrastructure 1.17 billion, the community and culture and recreation was 140.3 million, rural and northern communities received 152.3 million, and the COVID resilient stream was 199.9 million, which was launched in 2020. So federal funding, they pay based on progress claims. So in 2020-2021, 5.6 million was received. So I want to highlight, uh, while infrastructure leads the ICIP program from Alberta, um, it is administered across ministry, like it's a cross-ministry initiative with other participating, participating ministries, including advanced education, culture, status and women, environment and parks, Indigenous relations, municipal affairs, seniors and housing, and transportation. And it's transportation that gets to administer the bulk of this with the public transit stream, which does include that smart card uh, that you, you discussed. So that that's, so we're getting a substantial amount and it's just starting to come in the door in 2020-2021. Thank you. And um, how many ICIP projects were approved and which communities have mainly benefited? And also, can the department share with us what has been done to make uh, sure the projects under this initiative are done as quickly as possible? So as of March 31st, 2021, uh, Alberta received federal approval for about 171 projects or bundles. So that benefits over 30 constituencies all, all across the province. So through these projects, we're investing about nine billion worth of design and construction work directly into communities. Um, the total investment includes 80 projects receiving 2.95 billion in federal funding for buildings or renewing culture, community and rec centers, recreational infrastructure, LRTs, water, wastewater systems, flood mitigation and indigenous projects such as power and broadband system upgrades. It also includes 91 COVID stream capital maintenance and renewal or municipal infrastructure projects receiving 160.3 million in federal funds. So these projects are constructed, um, are construction or upgrading of infrastructure such as sidewalks, trails, flood berms and stormwater infrastructure. So as of March 31st of 2021, we committed all of our ISIP funding uh, and so there will be no further intakes. What has been done to make sure that uh, the initiatives are built as quickly as possible? The projects that were selected were based in part on their shovel readiness and the ability to be done as quickly as possible. So approved recipients are required to report on their project status quarterly, enabling partner ministries and infrastructure to monitor progress and address any concerns as needed. So there have been some project delays due to COVID and supply chain issues, but partner ministries and infrastructure are really working collaboratively to make sure these approved recipients uh, continue their projects and move forward. And that's, that's what we're working. We're working together to make sure they get done. Well, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, 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 you are uh, working really hard. Uh, I know these two projects were, um, thought of for a while, but actually implemented uh, once they were finally implemented and, and the process was very, very quick. And I want to thank you because my communities are, are quite happy with the funding that they've received. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we'll now move on to the fifth rotation, which is an opportunity for each side to read questions into the record. Uh, official opposition, three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Page 28 references the ministry's key objective of reducing the environmental footprint of provincial infrastructure. How does the department currently measure the environmental footprint? What are its goals with respect to reducing the footprint? That, uh, what are the total annual greenhouse gas emissions of the buildings in infrastructure's portfolio? What is the estimated cost to get government-owned buildings to net zero by 2050? How many jobs could be created by such an investment? And what would the annual energy savings be? and the annual cost savings on those uh, en energy re reductions. And then I will pass that over to uh, my colleague from Edmonton Whitman. Thank you. Just uh, to follow up in writing, if you can just, uh, you, we've addressed that the P3 model 
doesn't well inherently include playground builds, but it does include a, the possibility of a grant to build a playground. Uh, a follow-up question to that for me is whether or not the P3 model includes uh, the creation and uh, building of childcare spaces. Is that included in the P3 model? Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleague, the member from uh, St. Albert. Thank you. Uh, Ministry revenues were $23.7 million higher than budgeted due to internal government asset transfers and gains on sales of surplus government properties. Um, will the department please table a full list of properties that make up this total of $23.7 million? Thank you. Anything else? Okay, very good. We'll uh, head on over to the government side, please, for the three minutes of reading, please. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Page 25 of the annual report states that in the 2020-2021, uh, uh, the ministry budgeted $528.3 million to manage owned and leased space, yet only $466.7 million were spent. Uh, $62.6 million is a significant cost reduction. Were these lower costs due to any specific savings initiatives? And my other question, on page 38, the statement of revenues and expenses has a line there for leases, uh, land, and buildings revenue. I see that the actual uh, has decreased from $34.1 million in 2020 to $10.9 million in 2021. Can you explain why this revenue has decreased so significantly? And I'll cede the rest of my time to the member for Livingston McLeod. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, page 26 of the annual report states that the Ministry finalized the non-government user policy in 2020-2021 to ensure leasing of surplus government-owned and minister space occurs on an equitable and consistent manner. What is infrastructure doing to ensure the space and government facilities is being used by these valuable organizations, many of them being, of course, nonprofits with limited financial resources, is being provided fairly and in a fiscally responsible manner? What was done to address the Auditor General's recommendations to improve certain project man management processes for capital projects in the Fort McMurray Residential Facility? And what benefits did infrastructure see from the actions taken to address the recommendation? And finally, what was done to improve the performance measures for capital projects as recommended by the Auditor General's recommendations? What have been the benefits of addressing these issues? And thank you for your time with Public Accounts this morning. That's everything. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks uh, uh, to the officials uh, for attending today and responding to the committee members' questions. We ask that outstanding questions be responded to in writing within 30 days and forwarded to the committee clerk. Are there any other items uh, for discussion under other business? Seeing none, the date of our next meeting is Tuesday, April 19th with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. So we'll now move on to adjournment. Those at table, uh, please be reminded to remove your own bottles and cups for the safety of LAO staff. I'll now call for a motion to adjourn. Would a member move that the meeting be adjourned? Uh, uh, member Reed has moved as such. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That motion is carried. See you on the 19th.